Greetings, salutations, respect, and love. I am Scott, and you, my dear friends, have wandered on to the prog corner. So pull up a chair, stick around. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, 15 prog rock albums that have stood the test of time, albums that were good when they came out, but over the years just seem to get better and better to these ears. Uh, yeah, so before we get started, a quick shout out uh, to the great uh, symphonic prog rock band out of Barcelona, Spain, Regna, for sending me a copy of their new album on vinyl cinema. Uh, it is their debut album. It is amazing, and I did a review of it last week, so check it out. You might like it. I love it, actually. But here we go, man. Uh, 15 prog rock albums that just get better and better over time, and I'm starting at number 15 with Carmen. Who? Carmen Fandango's in space. I love this album, man. This was uh, their 1973 debut. It was uh, produced by Tony Visconti. And this band was kind of like uh, uh, Flamingo Prog, if you want. When I first heard it, I wasn't, uh, I thought it was maybe a little gimmicky. But uh, actually, this is a phenomenal album that over the years has gained a little bit more impact and importance because the bass player was John Glasscock, who went on to join uh, Jethro Tull, and the drummer is a guy named Paul Fenton who went on to play in T-Rex. So, you know, it is that kind of record, but man, I love this thing. Really solid. That's my number 15. Yeah, at number 14, man, I'm going with Nectars, a tab in the ocean, because honestly, I always uh, liked this album, but uh, over the years, I've gained way more of an appreciation for it. And I want to thank Iron Maiden for that. And yeah, as you can see, I got my Iron Maiden background today. I was wearing my Iron Maiden t-shirt a couple days ago. Uh, they covered uh, a song off this, King of Twilight, uh, that uh, was on the B-side of Ace is High. Uh, but look at that artwork, man. This is such a cool album. I just love it. It's uh, Roy Albrighton. Mick Brockett, Alan Freeman, uh, Derek Moore, and Ron Howden. What a great lineup. What a great band. I absolutely adore Nectar. And this album just gets better and better over time for me. Yes, it does. At number 13, let's go to Australia and Sebastian Hardy in their debut album, Four Moments. This thing is phenomenal, man. If you like Mellotron, if you like Symphonic Prague, this album is way better than I gave it credit for. came out in 1976. Kind of like at that tail end of the classic era of prog rock. But this thing should not be thought of any less because it came out towards the tail end of it. It's just incredible. Uh, you've got the Plapsic Brothers, uh, Mario Millo, and Tolvo Plult. What a great band. Their second album was really good too. But uh, this debut, man, just phenomenal. I absolutely love it. At number 12... We're going to the UK. Yeah, and it's Moon Madness. Yeah, I hate this album cover. I, I like the UK version better. But, you know, they... Uh, why would they look at this and say, oh, yeah, this is a better album cover than this? So for years, I just thought this thing was not nearly as good as uh, Mirage or the Snow Goose. I was dead wrong. This thing is amazing. Andy Ladmer, Peter Bardens, Doug Peterson, uh, Andy Ward. This has got Lunar Sea on it. Song Within a Song, Another Night. Airborne. This album gets better and better over time. It absolutely does. At number 11, we're staying in the UK with the keyboard-driven band Greenslade, led by the great Dave Greenslade. Uh, he was joined by Dave Lawson, who was uh, coming fresh off of being part of Webb, and then Webb changed their name to Samurai, so he was on that one Samurai album. Then he got Tony Reeves, who was in uh, uh, Coliseum uh, with Dave Greenslade, and the lineup is rounded up by Andrew McCullough, who was obviously part of Fields and King, uh, King Crimson. I love this album, man. The Roger Dean artwork doesn't hurt, but uh, it's just a phenomenal record. Their second album, Bedside Manners, are extra. I always kind of like that one better, but this one here just seems to get better and better every time I listen to it. I've known about this album for 50 years, and it still gets better and better every time I hear it, and that's why it's on this list at number 11. At number 10, 
Yeah, I'm going with John Anderson's Elias of Sun Hillo. I'm putting it down at number 10 because honestly, I've always loved this album. Uh, but man, it just gets better and better every year. This, for a long time, was my nighttime music. You know, if I had a little insomnia or whatever, you know, put this thing on in the headphones and you're good to go. But uh, over time, I've realized that not only is this just a phenomenal album, but it is the best of all the Yes solo albums. I like it better than The Six Wives of Henry VIII. I like it better than Fish Out of Water. I think it's absolutely perfect. And to me, it just gets better and better and fresher. Might have been the first New Age album ever. Who knows? But I absolutely adore this thing. It's phenomenal at number nine. You know, we can't do one of these countdowns without talking about an Italian band. So which one am I going to be talking about today? Well, today we're talking about Aria, Aria, whatever. They're more like jazz fusion-y than a lot of the uh, RPI bands. But to call them fusion doesn't do them any credit at all. This band is a one of a kind. They're so weird. I got into it in the comments section uh, a couple weeks ago with somebody that was claiming, hey, why do you even talk about them, man? They're not prog rock. I'm like, well, if they're not prog rock, what are they, man? Uh, Demetrio Stratos vocals, just amazing. Patricio Ferizelli, uh, Guilio Cap Capiazzo, Anes Tavalazzi and Paolo Tafoni. Uh, Patricio, Aris, and Paolo are still going strong, still keeping uh, Ari alive, even though the great Demetrio Stratus left us a long time ago. And uh, they put out a lot of great albums, but this is probably my favorite. Every time I listen to it, I hear new things, and I'm thinking, how in the world was this 1975, man? Talk about being ahead of their time, and I just love crack. What a great album. It's amazing. You know I love my Italian Prague at number eight. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Danger Money. Mm -mm -mm. The debut gets all the love. And why wouldn't it? You got Dr. Bill Bruford and Alan Holdsworth. But after they left, they wanted to you know, do some different things. And Eddie Jobson and uh, John Wenton wanted to go possibly a little bit more commercial. If this is their version of commercial, I'll take it all day long, man. For years and years, I always thought this was you know, kind of like the red-haired stepchild of the two. But you know what? Over time, this album just gets better and better. It sounds better. What a fantastic record. Uh, Rendezvous, the only thing she needs. Caesar's Palace Blues, nothing to lose. Carrying no cross. Just amazing. And like I said, I think this record gets better and better over time. Terry Basio's drumming is just phenomenal here. I love it. It's amazing. At number seven, we're going to the United States of America, man. And uh, Happy the Man just announced they uh, are putting out a new record. They dropped a new single last week. And I'm including their second album, Crafty Hands, from 1978. Yeah, their debut in 77 was phenomenal. I always loved it. This one here... <laughs> You know, Ken Scott was the producer of both of them, and the story goes is that when they uh, came to the studio to start recording the second album, Ken Scott was all upset because they had a different drummer. Uh, Mike Beck was on the first album. This one here's got Ron Riddle. Apparently, they're both in the band now. Happy the man's rocking two drummers, and they're both amazing. They have totally different styles. Uh, Mike was like a banger, and he just beat the heck out of the drum kit. Ron Riddle was Kind of like a Terry Bazio guy, just all over the kit, just playing all kinds of phenomenal stuff. Uh, my esteem for this album has done nothing but go up and up and up over the years, and that's why I've got it at number seven on the list, man. Happy the man at number six. From 1976, this band's debut album, they're from Champaign, Illinois, and uh, I remember hearing Lady of the Lake on... Uh, uh, FM radio in Milwaukee. I thought it was a new Yes song because, you know, Yes was in the middle of their solo album break. So I knew it wasn't Yes, but uh, I was confused, man. And then the dude said it was a band named Star Castle and I ran to mainstream records in downtown Waukesha, Wisconsin, bought this thing. Later on that day, I had to go meet my dad. He was teaching at Marquette and we were going to go, you know, watch the Marquette basketball game. So I went onto the campus with this record underneath my arm, you know, and I'm like, you know, all proud. Yeah, here I am, you know, a little 14 year old kid, 13 or whatever at the time. And I got my Star Castle album and everybody was stopping to say, hey man, I know those guys. Those guys are awesome. Yeah, they are at number five. Oh yeah. Let's talk about Rush. 
Yeah, and I almost went with the Grace Under Pressure here, but this isn't albums that we've had a change of heart about because that record I never liked. <laughs> I never liked it, but honestly, over the last two or three years, Grace Under Pressure sounding way, way better to me, but I'm talking about records that I always like, but just kind of get better and better over time. And I'm talking about Caress of Steel, Oh, yeah, and maybe this album keeps getting better and better over time because we know what occurred afterwards, right? This was kind of pointing the way uh, to a new Rush sound, to a more progressive kind of sound for the band. And had they retreated and gone back to their, you know, blues rock, Led Zeppelin aping days after this, this record would probably just be considered an outlier or an anomaly and forgotten about. But as it stands now, this is kind of like the building block that took us to 2112 and Hemispheres and a Farewell to Kings and Moving Pictures and Permanent Waves and all the genius stuff that would come later. But it kind of starts right here, and I love this album. Over the years, the more I listen to it, the more I enjoy uh, Fountain of Lameth and The Necromancer. And I think I'm going bald and uh, Bastille Day. Wow, what a great album. I absolutely love it, man. Let's go back to the solo album well, shall we? And uh, an album that I've always had came out in 1980. It was Mike Rutherford's uh, first solo album. And uh, he was recording this uh, right in between, uh, and then there were three in Duke, that kind of period. Uh, he's got Anthony Phillips, but he's not playing guitar, he's playing keyboards, because uh, Mike Rutherford handles all the bass and all the guitar on this. We've also got Simon Phillips on drums, so you got two Phillips, two genius Phillips dudes on this record. And uh, you got Noel McCallum from the Man for Man's Earth Band singing, but I love this thing, man. I... <sighs> What was I doing? Why did I not love this album when it first came out, man? Maybe it was the uh, the shorter tracks on side one that I didn't really click with. But side two is a side-long epic that's absolutely amazing, man. And then as I go back over the years and I listen to those shorter tracks on side one, I love them. This is an amazing album. Uh, Mike Rutherford, Small Creeps Day, and I got it at number four. At number three... An album that I liked when I got it, but man, I was confused about it. I really didn't know what to think about it. I, I enjoyed it. I listened to it a lot. I was living on a sailboat in the Caribbean, and songs like Formentera Lady just really rung my bell. Hey, the whole album's called Islands, and that's what we were doing. We were, you know, island hopping, you know, from the Bahamas to the Turks and Caicos to Haiti to the Dominican Republic to, you know, the Virgin Islands and all, you know, everything in between. So Islands would have been... You know, perfect for me, but I wasn't quite sure about it, man. Uh, but over the years, I have come to develop an absolute love for this album. It isn't trying to do anything, man. It's just being itself. And that is so refreshing and so cool, so amazing. Uh, Sailor's Tale, Letters, Ladies of the Road, Islands, just perfect. I love this album. And like I said, it gets better and better over time. And that's what we're talking about here today at number two. This one's for, uh, this one's for the Colonel Ed. Uh, this is a band called Gypsy. Uh, they were from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, at some point, like back in 1968, they moved to LA and they became the house band for the Whiskey A Go Go, a gig that they held down for over two and a half years, at which time they made a lot of friends and met a lot of people. And apparently there was a little bidding war for them. They signed to this small, small label called uh, Metro Media. Uh, this is their first album from 19, what, what is this thing? 1970, uh, they had a second album that I really liked from 71 called In the Garden. And then they went to a major, they went to RCA, put out a couple more albums that were a little more commercial. But man, this debut album, it's a double album for a debut album, 1960. Cool artwork, you know, pictures of the boys in the band there. Yeah. And I guess Enrico Rosenbaum was the leader of this band, but probably of note as the drummer. Uh, Bill Lorden went on to a drum with Sly and the Family Stone, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but I love this album. It is fantastic, and it just sounds better and better over time. It hasn't aged a bit. That, you know, hippie flavor still sounds great to these ears, 
But yeah, man, the one album I got here that has stood the test of time better than any other, and you know, how objective a statement is that? But I'm going with Patrick Mraz and the story of I. This thing here, man, as a kid, you know, getting all those Yes solo albums between Relayer and going for the one. This one here and the Alan White one were like, huh, what, what's going on here, man? I figured out the Alan White one, you know, it was just a bunch of songs, but this one remained a mystery to me. I knew there was a lot of great stuff going on here. I can only imagine what Amit Erdogan and the people at Atlantic thought when uh, Patrick Mraz sent them these tapes. Said, here, here you go. Here's my solo album, man. Well, it, it didn't do great. It hit uh, 132 on the Billboard charts. And uh, I, I just think it's a phenomenal album with all the Brazilian and Latin instrumentation, the percussion. A lot of this was uh, recorded down there in Rio de Janeiro. Tells a weird story of a tower being built in the middle of a jungle. And you have everything you want in this tower, but you're not allowed to fall in love. Well, I guess a couple falls in love and they escape from the tower. That's the story. It doesn't make any sense. But man, oh man, this is great. And as an extra bonus, you've got Jeff Berlin on bass. Yeah, so that's my wrap-up of uh, the 15 prog rock albums that have stood the test of time, that have gotten better and better over the years. Um, anyway, next... Uh, Sunday prog stream this Sunday, this weekend, man, is going to be amazing. Sunday at 1 o'clock Eastern, uh, me and the gang, we're going to be talking about the greatest of all American bands, Kansas. Now we're going to be breaking it down, talking about their 10 best songs and whatnot, whatever else. Anyway, that's going to be awesome. And don't forget Friday, every Friday at noon on Prog Radio, it's the Prog Corner playlist where everything I've been talking about on the channel all week, Kevin's going to play. You know, we work together, put together a playlist to try to, you know, cover all the stuff we're talking about because you clowns keep crying that I don't play music on the channel. I do not play music on the channel. I do not want my channel will get deleted and all my hard work to be eradicated in a snap of a finger. Not going to happen. I'm not taking that chance. So if you want to hear what I've been talking about, go to Prog Radio. Kevin will hook you up, man. He's just awesome. What a great station. Anyway, peace in the Middle East. Free Tibet and God save the king. Save King Chucky. Save King Charles III. That son of a gun needs your saving. Peace. I'll see you Sunday.